as we talk about serving to masters, it's so important that we understand what we're talking about. And I said we have to define worldliness because if we don't know what it is, we can't recognize it or repent from it. And that's why it's so important that during your time um, in any type of spiritual growth, that time is spent truly analyzing behavior. And that might seem like, oh, let's not be legalistic. Let's not get you know, too caught up in works or deeds. But I really believe that in our pursuit of holiness, which is a great book by A.W. Tozer, um, you have to assess your behavior, beha- your behavior. You have to look at the way you're living and truly compare it to Jesus and say, you know, how can I be more like Christ? And that requires us to be specific. And being specific is not fun, but it's effective. The reason we're spending so much time on this uh, worldliness, and again, we're at some point we're going to just talk about materialism for weeks because that again I think is one of the greatest hindrances to American Christianity is materialism and and money. We're going to deal with that. Actually, it got cut off. Next week we're going to begin with finances and money, but. Our greatest spiritual battle is against the world. And I I put that as the first note on the sheet. It was on there last week because I really want to hit that point and get us to understand there's nothing greater that we're going to fight than Satan and his forces of darkness that have the world in the palm of their hands that they're manipulating and sending after us to win us over to the dark side, if you will. Our weapons that we fight with, I said three last week, and they were based from the text in Colossians, which says, since then you've been raised with Christ. And then we looked at the one that says, if then you have been raised with Christ, which I like that. Set your minds, well, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So the first weapon is setting our minds on seeking things above, not the earth. We have to make up our mind because if we don't change our mind, our actions won't change. Our actions can't change until we've set our mind on things above and wanting to live for things above. The second weapon, your earthly nature is dead, act like it, is so ultimately true. When we've died with Christ, we have died to sin. Paul says in Romans 6, you've been buried with Christ or you've died with Christ. and so you've died to sin, or you've died with Christ, dead to sin. Anyway, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? And so we are dead to sin. Let's act like it. That's why Colossians 3, 5, put to death. And then the NASB says, consider um, your earthly nature dead. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, and because of these the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. And he lists them again, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And he says it like so matter-of-factly, you're like, man, that's really hard. But he's saying it to these group of people who are set free by the Spirit, the same as I could say it to you. Oh, just stop. Just rid yourselves of all of these things. Be like, ha, 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 ha. You know, that's funny, Paul, but the Colossian church wasn't laughing when Paul said it. I don't think. I wasn't there. But it's really uh, setting our minds on it and then acting like we have been made new in the attitude of our minds. So weapon three leads us into this week. Hate what is evil or hate God. I added that last part because of the text for this week. So I added that or hate God part because you have to decide which it's going to be. Our text from Matthew 6, 24 is the theme text for this message about serving two masters. You know the text. You probably could all quote it. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And notice, for those of you who aren't used to having scripture on the note sheet, there is a couple scriptures, there are a couple scriptures on the note sheet, and so you'll see underlines in a couple of the verses, like this one. The idea that we can love God and love our stuff 
is a lie. The idea that we can have a master on earth and a master in heaven is just a lie. It's just not true. We cannot dual serve. We cannot have two number ones in our life. No matter what it is, whether it's our possessions or whether it's our family, Francis Chan's book, You and Me Forever, is an excellent book that really hits home the idea of idolizing your children and your spouse. Because in, in the midst of our Christian endeavors, we might get rid of things in the world, but then idolize our families and make our families our number one in our life, even over God. And that's just, a, it's a great, he, he does a really great job of sort of bringing that down to earth and saying, well, look, are we really idolizing our children and put making them our master. You can't serve two masters. Either you hate what is evil or you hate God. That, it's as clear as day. And we've, we've seen that through several texts that we looked at both last week and um, other weeks. But the point is that when it comes down to these things that we're going to discuss and looking at these areas of worldliness, as you start to identify the areas of worldliness in your life, it's going to be a call to change, a call to repent, a call to say, okay, I have been serving two masters. I have been. In this area of my life, I've been choosing worldliness over God. And it's time for me to make those changes and not serve two masters anymore. The text that is going to really set the stage is 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. Because this godly sorrow that's going to be produced is important for us because it leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. The wages of sin is death. And it's not coincidental that he said worldly sorrow brings death. People who aren't really trying to stop are going to continue in their sin and it's going to overrule them. It's going to overpower them at some point. They're just going to die in their sin and that's going to be the end of it. And we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be those people who fake repentance, who have that false repentance, who say, oh, I want to do so much better, but then never do any better. It's like you get in a car and you say, I want to go somewhere, but you never turn the ignition on and put the car in gear. Okay, if God's given you the power of the Holy Spirit and you're sitting in it, and the power is available to you, it's totally our fault for not engaging that power that's available to us and overcoming our sin. So the worldly sorrow sits there, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me, and never does anything about it. The godly sorrow is, woe is me, and then they go and do something about it. This is what it produces in you, and this is what's so important for us to recognize in our battle against worldliness. Look at what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, okay, hating what is evil. What alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. When the godly sorrow manifests itself in true repentance leading to salvation, you can tell people. You know, you can say what I've said from a pulpit in the past. You can look at anything in my life. You can have my phone. You can look at my web browsing history. You can look at every text I've sent, every picture I've taken, every Google search I've made. You can look at all of these things because I have nothing to hide. I'm eager to clear myself. If anyone says, aha, we've caught you, I'll say, here, here's my whole life. You don't even need a search warrant. Come on in. I'll give you the keys to my house. I'll leave, let you look around. This is the innocent. You've proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. If you have no sin to hide, then who cares if Big Brother's watching? Okay? It, it's one of those things. And when you find something wrong in your life, you don't say, oh, it's no big deal. No, there's indignation. There's alarm. Someone points something out, which might happen tonight. You don't go, oh, I'm going to sweep that under the rug and deal with it later. You go, okay, I've got to deal with this. You open up the word and it, and it just convicts you of your sin. And you don't say, oh, it's no big deal. Uh, blah, blah, blah. No, alarm, indignation. Eagerness to clear yourselves. Okay, I'm going to get this out and open. I'm going to confess. It's that this whole me too thing against these pastors and these people who have been accused of promiscuity and these, these 
you know, uh, Im immoral relationships or whatever, and they're all like, no, it wasn't me, I didn't do it. You know, if they did it, and they were godly, had godly sorrow and were truly repenting, they'd want to clear themselves, and they'd come out and say, yeah, yep, it happened, and I'm ashamed of it. And I want to be clear of this. I want to clear myself, I want to get it out, and just confess. I'm not saying that everyone that gets accused is guilty, but the ones who are guilty, and then you find out after they've denied themselves like 10 times, it comes out that they're guilty. Like, gee whiz, you know, what's going on? So as we move forward, I want to gently define worldliness. I want to gently define it. Because in 2 Timothy 2, this is how Paul is trying to go about this. And I want to use him as my model. So you would be the Lord's servant in this uh, text. The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. And so that's, well, I actually got that backwards there for just a second. But anyway, so I'm trying to gently instruct you. You all must not quarrel amongst yourselves. We must not quarrel between us. And the point is that he must gently instruct. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Be very gentle in the hope that God will grant you all repentance. And me, myself. You know, I preach the gospel to myself all the time. You know, I read these things and I preach to myself and I'm saying, Paul, you know, this is something that you've got to work through. I'm not here to beat anybody up. I don't beat myself up. But I look at the word and I look at it in the hope that God will grant me repentance. And this is really important. Some people take this text too far and say that you can't even repent unless God grants it, and that would go against some of the other texts in Scripture. I believe that God is an active force, is actively working in your repentance, and that without the Holy Spirit, that you're destined to sin, and you're captive to your sin nature, and that you cannot break free from your sin nature without a work of the Holy Spirit. But then when it comes to repenting from these sins, the Holy Spirit is in you, you have to come alongside with it, I believe, and repent of it. The Spirit convicts you, so that's the work of the Spirit. God's granting you repentance by convicting you and showing you where your sin is. So you can't just say, well, until God grants me repentance, I'm never going to be done with this sin. It's, okay, I see the sin. I'm praying for God to grant me repentance from it, to lead me to a knowledge of the truth. See where this is going? And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Yeah, these are people in the church who have fallen back into such evil behavior that Satan has trapped them and taken them captive. Okay, and now Paul's telling Timothy, gently instruct them and lead them into a knowledge of the truth. So as we gently instruct, it will be offensive. And so I have to say that as well. Some of these things that we're going to talk about are going to be offensive, especially when it comes down to specifically identifying areas of worldliness that we all struggle with. We're all going to be like, okay. But what are you going to do about it? <laughs> One of the greatest confession time... One of the greatest struggles I have is when Julie points out something to me that I could do better. Or there was some, a mistake I've made, or some place or thing or time I've been wrong. Guess what I hate doing? I hate admitting I'm wrong. Okay? So when that happens, guess what I like to do? Well, you know what? Well, you did something else last week. You know what? You made me do it. You know, if you hadn't said it that way, I wouldn't have done that. Or well, if I hadn't been tired, or if I had just, uh, I was hungry. You know, just whatever. It's defensiveness. And I'm, I'm so ready to defend myself instead of ready to clear myself. Instead of being eager to say, okay, I was wrong. I need to do better. I'm more eager to say, I wasn't wrong. I'm going to defend myself. Because when things are offensive to me, like when someone points out my flaws, that's offensive. We have this fight or flight mentality where it's like, defend yourself. No. What did they say about Jesus? What did Peter say in 1 Peter 2, like 21 or 22? When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. 
When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Okay, they were hurling insults at Jesus about to crucify him. He was the king of glory. He's just, you don't matter to me. These insults don't matter to me. I don't need to defend myself. And so when, when we are offended, you know, we have to repent. We're not Jesus. But I'm, I'm, I'm using that as an example of his humility so that as things are revealed about us, we can humbly repent from them. This is where the text in Romans comes into play. I really enjoy this text a lot. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master. For you're not under law, but under grace. Okay, right here, he says, sin is not your master. You can't serve two masters. Paul says right here, you serve the one you choose to serve. And if you're in Christ, your sins are your choice. That's why he says, don't allow sin to reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Understand, and I'm making this point repetitively for a purpose, if you're in Christ, every sin you commit is your choice. You have freedom from every sin you can commit or could commit or will commit because of the Spirit in you. It's not saying that tomorrow you're going to just wake up and be perfect. <laughs> the sinful nature is way too strong for us to just wake up tomorrow and be like, hey, you know. But as we start to repent and see these sins in our lives, I believe what we'll do is we'll begin to look more and more like Jesus. And we'll never say, well, it's, you know, I can't do anything about it. The sin is too strong. This is, I'm just too weak. No, the spirit is stronger than anything that Satan can throw at me. And so I'm never going to face a sin with a defeatist attitude. No, I'm going to face it and say, hey, if I, if I gave into that sin, it's because I've offered the parts of my body to sin as instruments of wickedness. James says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Go on guard against the world. Keep yourself. Put up the armor of God. Use that sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith which we, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. As Satan is shooting his arrows at you, your shield of faith comes up and you're fighting back against the evil one. You're trying to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. The reality is we've all been polluted by the world. That's really the reality. We all have to a degree. The question is how badly have we been polluted by the world. So it's not a matter of I've not, I'm, I'm not polluted at all by the world because then you would be perfect. You would be sinless. You, you sin. We have sins. We have these desires in us that war against the law of our mind. And we have to figure out how to break free from these. So as you ask yourself these questions, you have to say, okay, maybe I don't struggle to the degree, the degree that someone else struggles, but there is some truth here, and there's some worldliness that has eked its way, if you will, or snuck into my life and has polluted me, and how badly am I polluted? I need an x-ray. I need an MRI. Okay? I need the Word to perform an MRI and tell me how bad it is inside. Jesus gives us three verses in John, 13, 15, and 17, that are going to lead us into our analysis, if you will, of worldliness. These are three of some of the most important verses, I think, in regards to our worldliness. And you have to pay attention to what he says. So I'm going to sum it up in a slide after these three verses and show you exactly what Jesus is saying. But pay attention to the 
facts. Pay attention to the facts of what Jesus is saying here. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. We, we get caught up in this hate language, okay? Uh, but again, here's Jesus using hate language, saying, hate your life. Referring to the life that you see, the life you perceive, your worldly life. Hate this life because you're looking forward to the next. This goes right along with the two masters that he teaches in Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve two masters. If you love your life now, you'll lose it eternally. If you hate this worldly life, you'll gain eternal life. Second, John 15 If the world hates you, good grief, Jesus, right? Get off the hate thing. It's like every time I turn around, Jesus is talking about hate. The world hates you. Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Okay, rewind to the beginning of the paragraph. If the world hates you, but I have chosen you out of the world, that is why the world hates you. So right at the beginning, this conditional phrase of if the world hates you divides the people between those who are following Christ and those who don't. It's like, if the world hates you, you're my follower. If it doesn't hate you, what I'm about to say doesn't apply to you. Okay? Because he clarifies in that part in bold. If the world doesn't hate you, it's because you are of the world. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. You would fit right in with the world. If you want a really great message on this, go look up Paul Washer's Shocking Youth Message. Okay, that's what it's called on YouTube. It's an hour of Paul Washer yelling at a bunch of teenagers. It's amazing. It's absolutely one of the best sermons I've ever heard. Because he just, he just gets so fed up. With, with the shenanigans of them jumping up and down and, and acting like crazy people during the worship, which is, is fine to a degree, but then when he calls them out, he's like, you're living like the world. All you want to do is just be like Britney Spears. And then they all cheer, yeah, and he goes, don't clap, I'm talking about you. He's like, this is real, this is real stuff. You know, you can't just keep seeking after the world and expect to be a follower of Jesus. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. It's a, it's a huge warning sign. If you fit in with everybody, that's a problem. The world should hate you. Literally. That's what Jesus says. Third, John 17. So if you want to go back and look at these again, it's neat. 13, 15, 17. Okay, and all these texts, he's talking about worldliness. And again, what's with the hate language, Jesus? Like right off the bat, 17, he's back on the hate thing again. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world. Now look, Jesus just up the ante again. Now he's saying that my followers are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Now he's saying that my followers are as different from the world as I am. Wow, okay, that's really tough. And he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, he says it again, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Let's summarize. I like summaries, okay? Summaries are good. First, the man who hates the worldly life will receive eternal life. John 13, 25. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. Why is the the plague of popularity so harmful and condemning? Because what we seek when we seek popularity is worldly approval. That's the worst and last thing we should ever be seeking because if the world accepts us, if the world is 
saying, yeah, you're just like us. You know, it's not saying that we can't get along with the world, because Paul even says that we should do um, things that please others. He said, anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Uh, in Romans 14, I believe, talking about loving others and, and things like this. But in a way, obviously, we're good citizens. We're not rebels. We're not out causing huge disturbances. I guess what he's saying is that we're not out <laughs> trying to get the world to hate us. Okay? We're not out with our hate speech signs and, and trying to cause people to hate us. But by the way we live, people see that we don't fit in. We don't belong to the world. And then third, what he said is that Christ's followers are not of the world like Christ is not of the world. So he's putting himself as the example on display. And so regarding the areas that we're going to deal with tonight, which are going to be these five, we're going to ask ourselves, how much are we like Jesus in these areas? In our outward appearance and self-promotion? In our leisure and entertainment? In our language and conversation? In sexuality, lust, and immorality, that's the area we'll spend the least amount of time on because that'll be, that'll be something that we would have to really go into um, with a more appropriate age group. And then fifth, eating and self-control. So we're going to ask ourselves in these five areas, and then I think there's four or five more for next week, what or how, how are we different than Christ in these areas? How are we fitting into the world in these areas? So let's get started. The worldliness of outward appearance and self-promotion. The worldliness of outward appearance and self-promotion. There is a rampant problem these days with self-promotion. And it's all driven by this inward desire that we have for people to validate us. And as we seek, especially online, to be validated, we do so by promoting an image of ourselves, typically that isn't even true. We try to make ourselves look the best that we possibly can, sharing only the good things that happen or the funny things that happen in order to make people see us in this light that probably, most often, I know for me, I try really hard not to go online and share just anything on Facebook if I'm not going to also share like, the whole story. Like, here's a really funny story about my kids. Then we all got mad and yelled at each other, and we all went to our rooms and, or whatever. It's like, like, here's the funny part. Don't see the bad stuff. You don't see the fact that you know this happened. And so there's this disillusionment that's occurring. There's this falseness that's occurring. But let's talk about appearance first. Okay, the most obvious place we go to is a text that Paul writes to Timothy about women's clothing. He says, I want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. We could apply this to men and women, especially when it comes to expensive clothing and wanting to make an appearance or make a, an impression by our appearance. I feel like one of the greatest lies that Satan has introduced to the church is that somehow the way we dress is a reflection of our heart towards God. And the fact that if you don't dress nicely at church, then you don't act nicely at home. Or if you don't wear your best to church, then you're not giving God your best. And we've started to create this environment in church that says, well, everyone dress up and look as nice as you can and all put together so everyone thinks that everyone is doing great. Or at least that everyone has enough money to dress as nicely as the other person. Which is just one of the greatest senses of worldliness and how it's infiltrated the church. Now we all just wear Halloween costumes, basically, to church on Sunday morning. Okay, I'm going to dress up like a well-put-together husband and I'm going to act like I love my kids and I'm going to be nice to my wife today. And then you take the Halloween costume off when you get home and it's, it's a different story. Don't worry, Brooklyn, I'm not talking about me. 
Uh, she's like, oh no, what's that? The point is, what Paul says here isn't just cultural. It's not just a cultural thing of saying gold, you know, the braided hair, sure, that can be a cultural thing. Braided hair doesn't necessarily scream wealth. But if you're going to dress for a gathering of believers, you want to be as low on the scale as you can be. You want to draw the least amount of attention to yourself and show the greatest humility that you possibly can. It's not a time to impress. We're not dressing to impress a church. Modesty, propriety. Okay, but modesty isn't the only problem here with appearance. Okay, I'm going to leave the modesty discussion there. Mainly for the reason that your heart is what's judged before God when it comes to modesty, not what other people think of you. Okay, this is really important. Because when it comes to whatever you wear at the beach or at the gym or at um, your vacation or in the summer or in the winter or springtime or whatever, your heart is what God will judge. And if you're dressing to impress or dressing to get looks, then God will judge you for that. And if you're dressing because this is what is comfortable or effective or efficient for whatever you're doing, and literally your heart has no care of what other people are thinking of you, then God will judge that heart as well. And, and this whole idea of women should dress a certain way because all men have bad thoughts in their minds, I don't buy that. Men, your, your thoughts should be taken captive to Christ. No matter what the girl walks by on the street wearing, your mind should be captive to Christ no matter what she wears. So again, it's not her fault for what men think, and women shouldn't be scared into dressing a certain way because they're afraid they're going to cause their brother in Christ to fall off the boat. Now there is a, obviously a line there. There's a very clear line that women shouldn't... There's certain things that you're like, okay, that's well, not good. Anyway, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to give examples. But... You have to let your heart be judged before God. Paul Washer puts it this way. He says for women and what they wear, if your clothing is a frame for your body, then that is wrong. If your clothing is a frame for your face, that is right. That is good. Because it, it makes people look at your face instead of at your body. So just again, we have to judge our hearts. When it comes to appearance, Let's ask ourselves some more questions, okay? Let's ask ourselves a few things about our appearance. How much do you focus on your appearance? How much time do you spend in front of a mirror? How much time do you spend preparing for the day before you think that you are acceptably presentable? How much time do you spend improving or altering or thinking about ways that you should or can improve your appearance or your body image? How much time do you spend getting ready every morning versus getting your soul ready every morning? Is it a bigger priority that your body look good before you walk out the door or your soul look good before you walk out the door? How much money do you spend on your appearance? Whether it's hair, makeup, health, whatever new weight loss supplement might be out. How about how does your attitude change based on your perception of your appearance? Meaning you feel good about the way you look and you feel good. You don't feel good about the way you look and you don't feel good. That's a problem. If your emotional state of being is directly attached to your perceived physical appearance, then you're valuing something that isn't the most valuable thing to value. <laughs> There's a lot of value there. <laughs> There's a lot of values. So we have to ask ourselves, are you constantly craving approval from others? Are you constantly craving approval from others? I've said this before. If you have more pictures of yourself on your Facebook page than you do of other people, you probably have a problem. I'm referring to selfies.
Are you constantly craving approval? Do you like to take pictures of yourselves, of yourself? Does your wardrobe keep getting bigger? Always have to buy something new because you think that whatever that is that you're buying that's new will make you look better than the old clothes you have. You see something that you think will improve your self-image or that will make you feel better about yourself. And so you're, again, putting your heart and your soul and investing in, in a physical world thinking that your value is, if, is in some way equatable to your physical parents and it's not your value has nothing to do with the way your body hair or makeup or muscles look I'll confess I became self-absorbed with the workout world for a long time I'll tell you I went 1032 days without missing a single meal logging into my fitness pal 1,032 days straight of tracking every single thing I ate because I was so obsessed. I idolized the health and fitness world. One day, God said, that's an idol. I said, you're right. Walked away from my fitness pal. I still like to exercise. Nothing wrong with being healthy. But I don't obsess over it. On days I miss my morning workout in the gym, I don't sulk that day. I used to be like, oh, I missed the, day the gym. What am I going to do? And it's just funny how we can just let it become so important to us when that's not the purpose of life. It's not the purpose of what we do. Do you use your appearance to validate or promote yourself online? That's a huge question. Do you use your appearance to validate or promote yourself online? Because that's, again, it's seeking approval from the world. It's trying to fit in with the world. It's trying maybe to an ego battle with someone else online. Or it's a, oh, look at who this is. Or someone likes who, how they look, so I need to look better than them. And it's all vanity. Vanity 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 it's a chasing after the wind what these questions reveal is pride self-conceit and vanity even down to the how much do you shop if you really have a a desire to own more things because that's like your therapy we, we really should talk. We really should talk about where your value and self-worth comes from. Because it should be Christ. It should be the Spirit. It should be who I am is a child of God. And that doesn't change based on my, my weight or my hair color or how I, how I feel that day. Paul says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Do you see that? Lovers of themselves. I can't tell you. I'm sure there are other generations that have had as much self-love as we have, but our generation is one that loves itself a lot. I mean, there's been no other generation where everyone has their own temple built to themselves online where we just talk about ourselves. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a voice. We love ourselves. We're proud. We're conceited. We're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with them. I'll let you think about that as we move on to leisure. Entertainment, sports, laziness. So this is the text we just read. This is the part of it that we're focusing on. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. In the very same phrase, in the very same breath, you could say lovers of themselves, which was just a couple words earlier, or lovers of pleasure. In the same way that, you know, we don't want to classify women as being the only ones who are, you know, concerned about their appearance, because men do as well. The same way that we can't say that men are the ones who are only consumed with entertainment and women aren't. 
okay? I mean, everyone's gonna struggle with this to a certain degree. So men don't write off the appearance section at all, that's a woman thing. Woman, women don't write off the entertainment leisure thing, oh, that's a man thing. So what the question is, we have to ask ourselves, what do we love? What do we love? I've talked a lot in the past. I have a series online, you know, called Rated M that I preached previously that you could go and look at about content. I'm not going to spend time talking about inappropriate content. That should be a no-brainer. Rated R movies should be off limits, um, unless it's The Passion of the Christ. I think everyone should see that movie um, because it really brings home a lot of things that you just can't, you can't imagine, you can't even imagine. I mean, it's just, it's brutal. So, I'm not going down the path of inappropriate content tonight. I'm going to deal with a different issue. The question is, do you love it? Are we lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God? So here are some questions to think about as we dive deep into entertainment, sports, leisure. Binging on anything is debauchery, regardless of how wholesome it is. So when you ask yourself, how much time do you spend on you every day versus him? That should be a pretty clear indicator. When it comes down to free time and leisure time, how much of your leisure time are you giving to God versus how much of your leisure time do you keep for yourself? I'm not going to set a limit on what it should be or shouldn't be. I'm just saying, does he get any of it? I mean, that would be like a bare bones minimum standard. I think he should get quite a bit of it. But when it comes down to our leisure time, how much of it does he get versus how much do we spend on ourselves? But we have this phrase binge watching these days and, and we think that just because we binge watch HGTV that it's okay. There's a number of problems with binge watching HGTV. One is that HGTV breeds discontentment. And that's where I've been there as well. I've wanted all of the best stuff because I, I became so convinced that what they had on HGTV was worth having. And I wanted it. And I sought after it. And I got it. And I had it. And it wasn't fulfilling. And so whether it's HGTV or, or uh, Full House, binge watching anything is a waste of your time. Now, I'm not saying that some people that you should never watch TV at all, I, I would commend that, but I really would say the amount of TV you watch should be balanced against how much time you spend with him, balanced in a way. So ask yourself, how much money do you spend on vacations? talking about leisure. The person who makes $50,000 a year and spends $5,000 on a Disney vacation has just tied his income to Disney World. Put that in perspective. The person who makes $50,000 a year and spends $5,000, which is so easy to do, has tied their income to Walt Disney. Again, how much are you giving away compared to how much are you spending on yourself? Is TV your refuge instead of God? Is TV your master? So then the question becomes, when it comes to your weekly favorite television shows that you've never missed an episode of, are you that consistent and religious about your time with God? If you have the discipline to never miss an episode of your favorite TV show, you should be disciplined enough to never miss an episode of your quiet time with the Father. That's just a fact. You've got it in you. I mean, that's where we have to compare our behavior. Okay, if my behavior is extremely disciplined at work, yet I come home and I'm not disciplined at all, well, that means I'm valuing what I do at work more than what I do at home. If my entertainment schedule is I've never missed a football game for my favorite team, but I can't seem to read the Bible to save my life, well, that shows very clearly that my cares are way more for the things of this world than they are for the things of God. And finally, do sports dictate your attitude? Just the same way, again, the same way that your appearance, you wake up in the morning and 
You got a big zit. And the whole day you're just ticked at the world because you got a zit. But the same thing today, if your football team lost and you're mad for even 10 minutes, you got to question, why am I invested in what these 20-somethings are doing? Who cares? They're all going to be unemployed and broke in five years. They're going to be selling insurance or something. I mean, there's nothing wrong with selling insurance. My mom <laughs> works in the insurance industry. Just saying. Um, do they dictate your attitude? We have to break free. If my team loses, nah, they lost. It was a fun game, hopefully. If not, it was a terrible game. Oh, well. Let's move on. Ask yourself this question. Why are actors and athletes the highest paid people in our society? And if you wondered, let me show you the statistics. The 100 best paid athletes made $3.8 billion last year, including endorsements, up 23% from the previous year. Anyone else get a 23% raise? <laughs> we all laugh. I would love a 23% raise. 100 best paid athletes, total salary, $3.8 billion. Okay, the top one was Floyd Mayweather, who made $285 million. And most of it came from one boxing match, one, that they sold so many pay-per-view episodes for that I think he made 260, 260 million out of the 285 off that one pay-per-view fight. LeBron James is number six, making 85 and a half million a year. Roger Federer is making 77 million a year. Number eight is Stephen Curry, making 77 million a year. Matt Ryan makes 67 million a year. Matthew Stafford makes about 60 million a year. And who pays their salary? We do. Together, the world's 10 highest paid actors tallied $748.5 million between June 2017 and June 2018, before fees and taxes. Dwayne The Rock Johnson's number two banked $124 million from his movies in one year. One year. And in case you're wondering, just out of comparison, Robert Downey Jr. made $15 million for his appearance of five minutes or so on Spider-Man. Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, only made $12 million the entire year working for Fortune One, the most valuable company on earth. And yet Robert Downey Jr. made more than Tim Cook's year's salary for a little cameo appearance on Spider-Man. Why? Because the world values what they do more than anything else. That's why. The one thing the world loves more than anything else is sports and movies or TV or entertainment. I tallied up the top 10 CEOs in the world. The top 10 CEOs combined incomes of 661 million. So that's where I get the statement I made that athletes and actors are the best paid people in the world. Because when you add up the top 10s, they're higher than the top 10 CEOs. The world values what actors and athletes do more than anything else. The question is, do you? Do we value the entertainment and athletic enterprises of the world more than anything else? We have to be very careful how much money, time, energy we put into these things because these ungodly salaries that these people are making are paid by us. We pay them. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Next, the worldliness of language and conversation. We spent some time last week talking about this, so once again I'll remind you and then we'll go a little deeper. Ephesians tells us two things. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up, and it may benefit those who listen. And Ephesians 5, 4 says... But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Which is why we should be absolutely abhorrent of any spiritual leader using obscenities, especially when it comes to the family of God or in the church. I mean, that should just be an absolute no-brainer. But for us as well, there shouldn't be any. But what about euphemisms? There's a great word, kids. See if you can spell euphemisms. Okay? E-U-P-H-E-M-I-S-M-S. -S. Euphemisms. This, these are also known by uh, Tim, 
Tim, what, Tim Hawkins is Christian cuss words. Tim Hawkins has a hilarious video of Christian cuss words, also known as euphemisms. What are they? Mild or indirect words or expressions substituted for one considered to be too harsh or blunt. So we don't want to say the four-letter word, so we say darn. We don't want to say the four-letter word, so we say crud or whatever. Okay, I could give lots of examples. We all know what they are. You know, uh, one of my favorites is boogers. Oh, boogers. I say that all the time. And it's like, I really feel like I should stop saying that because what I'm really doing is I'm substituting an expletive for boogers. You know, I'm just saying something that doesn't mean what it means. I'm using words that don't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. So euphemisms, fitting in words for other words that have no meaning, really goes against what Jesus said when he said, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. Doggone it, that's another one I use. I shouldn't, I don't know what dogs being gone have to do with it, but I need to let my yes be yes, and I need to let my no be no. There should be no need for me to escalate the emphasis of anything I say by adding extra words that have no meaning. They're just not helpful. They're not productive. They're not building others up. They're not making me look more intelligent. That's the truth. I hear a lot of people use a lot of four-letter words. No one goes, wow, they're intelligent. And then we're back to the whole appearance thing. Now I care more about what I think about what people see in me than about actually doing what God wants me to do and having wholesome speech. So, wow, see how quickly that can come in? So, it's not just our language that's a problem. It's not just our language that's the problem. What about our conversation? So, I had to throw in that euphemism thing. Now let's go deeper. Let's ask ourselves some questions. When it comes to how you talk about your spouse, do you speak more words of encouragement or criticism to your spouse? Do you criticize more than you encourage is how I worded it on the screen. How many of your words that you speak our scripture, just in day-to-day -day language. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. When you memorize scripture, it'll come out in your speech or referring to scripture or referring to anything of God, any praise that's coming out of your mouth, not just scripture, but praises of God, thankfulness to God. How many words are coming out of your mouth that are praiseworthy? And then what quantity of your words are worthless? Not edifying, not building up anyone, meaning talk about things that really don't matter. And we're all guilty. We're all going to have a quantity of words that we waste in the day that have no meaning. Like if I were to talk about um, some computer program or something that I was working on in one of my jobs and was just sharing just blah, 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 you know, to people who don't really care. I'm like, all right, if I'm... You know, like, worthless words. That's a bad example. I'm really talking more about TV. Talking about TV and movies and sports. Okay, that's what I'm really talking about. I'm going to be honest. How much time do we spend around the water cooler at work talking about things that just don't really matter? And then how many words from our mouth glorify God? How much of your speech is used to talk about yourself? How much of your speech is used to talk about yourself? That is a big, 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 big question. We talk about the things we care about most. And if we talk about ourselves most, guess who's number one in our lives? I talk about myself too much. I do. And we see it most in other people. That's the problem. We see it most in other people. Wow, they talk about them. They haven't asked me a thing about myself. You know, wish they'd stop talking about themselves and talk about me. <laughs> and you're like, wait a second. Now all of a sudden I'm hung up on myself again when they might just be sharing something they need help with. God might be giving you a chance to witness or, or offer some spiritual words to someone. You know, they're saying all this craziness and you say, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Have you read Psalm 23? That's a great place to go. Let's look at it or something. Instead of always making it about you. You, you, you. It's all about 
me? How much of your speech did you just talk about yourself? So we're going to go through this one relatively quickly. Um, again, because I, I don't want to get too deep into questions regarding sexuality, lust, and immorality. We know that Jesus says in Matthew 5, 28, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We know based on 1 Corinthians 6, sexual sins are worse than other sins. So write that down. That's something we all need to be aware of. Sexual sins are worse than other sins. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. He goes on. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Paul specifically defines sanctification, which this is just one area of sanctification, but he focuses on it that you should avoid sexual morality. Ask yourself regarding this, is your mind polluted by the world? Is your mind polluted by the world? There's so much vulgar sexual immorality in the world that it pollutes our minds, and then we start thinking these things that we shouldn't think. But I want you to understand that immorality is not the only danger with sexuality. There are so many elements of it that are healthy that can still be made, idol, um, made into idols in your life. There is still the same way that you can idolize anything that is good and you make it an idol and it's bad. This is the same thing. You can make something good into an idol and worship it the same as you can anything else. So, finally, let's finish with this. Eating and self-control. Philippians gives us one of the best texts on this. He says, For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Look at how Paul defines an enemy of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. So when it comes to food, we have to ask, do we worship our food? Does our attitude change greatly when we get to experience some really good food versus when we don't get really good food? Does our attitude revolve around what kind of food we get to eat that day? And if you end up in a place and you have to eat out of a vending machine or whatever, and you're like, oh, you know, I mean, or, or is there a restaurant that you just love to eat at that when you get to eat out that place that week, you literally look forward to it all week long. And it's like the pinnacle of your week. I'm only saying this because I've been there. I've done that. I mean, I've, I've lived those days when it's been like, oh yeah, it's awesome. Give me a steak, you know, and it's, it's. It's food worship, where I live to make my stomach happy. White Castle. Yeah. No, I don't like White Castle at all. I mean, it's fine. I know. But you love White you. <laughs> That's hilarious. You talk to your dad about that. Here's the thing about food. Overeating is sinful. It's what you crave. Overeating is sinful. Why? Because your body is a temple. There are just as many health risks involved in overeating as there are in how many, who knows how many other detrimental things that we would never do, like smoking, um, getting drunk, drinking alcohol. Food addiction is just as real as alcoholism. And yet, in the church, overeating and food addiction is accepted. In fact, as a youth minister, I promoted it among my kids at times. I'd ordered 14 pizzas, eat all you want, all night, yeah, let's just eat, 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 there's cake and cookies, let's eat, 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 you know, it's, and it was one of those things where it was like, it was so interesting to see how a lot of the things that we do revolve around eating, and the most, and the greatest thing we do is filling our stomachs. 
And we don't think about food addiction. We don't think about overindulgence. We don't think about debauchery related to our food. So the same text that refers to sexual immorality, I think applies. Your body is a temple. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. So we need to be careful about the way we treat our bodies. And like I just said, this is another widely accepted sin throughout the church. And going back to appearance, I think being overly consumed with our appearance is a very accepted, very accepted sin in the church, the same way that overeating is. So let me ask you a few questions as we finish this section here. First, do you treat your body like a temple? Your body is a temple. Are you treating it that way? Have you ever fasted? It's a great question. Jesus says when you fast, not if you fast. And so that's a, it's a great question to test our dependence on food. Going back to the vanity idea, is your physical appearance the only motivation for how you eat? So you could tie these two things together and say, the only reason I eat the way I do is because I want to look the way I want to look. And then all of a sudden you're worshiping the appearance idol with the food idol. And the food idol is serving the appearance idol, which is serving the self-promotion idol, which is serving the whatever other idol you might have. And so many of these things work together. And it's like, I'm only going to eat right because I want to look better. Versus, I need to be healthy. I want to I want to live as long as God gives me on this life to live. And the whole idea of I'm going to die when I'm going to die, so it doesn't matter what I eat, is like slapping God in the face and saying, God, it doesn't matter what's going to happen. I'm going to treat my body the way I want to. You take me when you take me. I, I don't buy that. Do you turn to food when you should turn to God? That's another big one. Comfort food. It should be comfort God. Unless you've made your food into a God. And then you would go to your food for comfort instead of going to God. And a way to break that would be the next time you want to turn to food for comfort, fast. And say, God, I'm not going to eat again until you show up and help me through this. Until you become to me, for me, what I've made my food. I want you to be that for me. Jesus says it this way. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Are we people who need food or the words of God more? I wouldn't live without food. I've got to have my food. I've got to have my 200 grams of protein. Yeah, I lived that. I was like going to bed eating a chicken breast because I hadn't had my protein goal for the day. It's awesome. Awesomely terrible. Um, spiritually. So, again, there are still things in my life and many of these areas that I'm working on that are being revealed to me, that I'm seeing, that I'm becoming aware of, that I'm working on figuring out why do I do this? You know, why do I do this or why do I do that so that I can repent from them and leave them behind? A lot of these things I have have made great strides in a lot of these areas, but there's still a lot of room to grow, a lot of room to, to make progress. So look at it like the staircase. You're not gonna trip and fall down the stairs and all of a sudden be at the bottom and be like, yeah, I did it. You're going to take one step at a time, one day at a time. And as God opens your eyes to these different sins in your life, as you think, oh, wait, Paul talked about appearance. I'm seeing this today. Today, focus on that one. Don't go home and try to attack every single thing in one day or just become depressed, probably. I don't know. But deal with them as God reveals them to you, and God will grant you repentance to overcome these things. But the goal is to not be like the world and to be different and set apart from the world. So that's what we're trying to do. And next week we'll talk even more about being less like the world and more like Jesus.